Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. AI is the next revolution and technology platform shift. Did you know that the world's highest valued private AI unicorns, Databricks and OpenAI, valued at a collective 50 billion, are Berkeley co-founded companies? Yeah, go Bears. Thank you. Berkeley is the new epicenter of Silicon Valley's AI entrepreneurship ecosystem revolution. We are here today with a very, very special guest. And before I welcome him up to stage, I'm excited to welcome you on behalf of two organizations that are at the heart of this new ecosystem. And now, a word from our sponsors. <laughs> the Satarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, AKA the Center, AKA SKET, or SET, they have many names and nicknames, is an amazing campus organization that puts on classes and programs for students, for professionals, as well as for the greater global ecosystem interested in startups and entrepreneurship. I took the SCET classes when I was a student here on campus, and I'll just tell you, those classes changed my life. It's possible the House Fund wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those classes, and I'm excited we have the director of SCET, Ken Singer in the back, raise your hand. Thank you, Ken. You know who also took those classes? Entrepreneurs like the founder and CEO of DoorDash, a $30 billion company, and many other great alumni entrepreneurs like Tony who have taken these classes, learned about entrepreneurship, and went on to start huge impactful companies in the world. So if I were you, if, if I was a student in this room, after this I'd go sign up for one of these classes as fast as humanly possible. This event is also brought to you by the other co-host, the, ha the House Fund. My name is Jeremy Fiance. I'm the founder of the House Fund. Our team has been building and growing the startup community in and around UC Berkeley for over 12 years now, originally as students. We launched the House Fund as the first venture capital fund fully focused on Berkeley. We're the only fund that invests exclusively in companies that have at least one Berkeley-affiliated founder. We've already invested in nine companies that have gone on to reach unicorn status. Our companies have raised over $5 billion in follow-on financing and been acquired by companies like Google, Facebook, and iconic Berkeley companies like Apple and Tesla. Our focus today is primarily in and around artificial intelligence, and so we're really excited to bring Dr. Andrew Ng here today. And now it's showtime. Today, you get to hear from one of the world's greatest leaders in AI. Dr. Andrew Ng, the managing general partner at AI Fund, the founder at deeplearning.ai, an adjunct professor at our rival university across the bay that will not be named, and more importantly, a Cal alum. As a pioneer in both machine learning and online education, Dr. Ng has impacted countless lives through his work in AI, including teaching over 8 million people about AI. He was the founding lead of the Google Brain team, which led Google's drive to adopt modern AI, as well as the chief scientist at Baidu. Dr. Ng is also the co-founder and chairman of Coursera, the world's largest MOOC platform, not to mention a multi-billion dollar public company in the market today. He was named one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world, and Dr. Ng now focuses his time primarily on his entrepreneurial ventures, looking for the best ways to bring AI to the world for good via his fund, AI Fund. And that's a big part of what brings us here today. Without further ado, I'm excited to welcome up Dr. Andrew Ng to give a talk about opportunities in AI. Let's give it up for Andrew. Thanks, Jeremy. 
And thank you, Jeremy, House Fund, um, all the organizers for having me here. It's really good to be back here at Berkeley. Um, did my PhD years ago, privilege of working with Mike Jordan, study with Sue Russell, Jatanja Malik, um, just saw Don Song a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, and Peter Beal, you know, was, was my student. So really glad to be back at Berkeley with uh, NC and, and place of a uh, lot of our friends and community. What I hope to do today is start off sharing with you one perspective on um, opportunities in AI, including maybe how you know, all of us here, all of you, um, could take advantage of some of these opportunities open to, to all of us. So <clears throat> I've been saying for a few years that AI is the new electricity. One of the tricky things to understand about AI is that it's a general purpose technology, meaning it's not useful for just one thing. If I was to ask you, what is electricity good for? You know, it's almost hard to name something because it's good for so many things. And I find that we have that challenge as well when thinking about where to apply AI. It's used for so many applications across so many diverse industries. Um, it's hard to almost pick one. Um, I want to start by sharing with you what I'm seeing in the technology landscape. And this will lead into where I think some of the richest opportunities are. A lot of excitement about AI, and I think a good way to think about AI is as a collection of tools. Um, of the different tools we have in AI, probably the most two, the two most important, I think, are supervised learning, which is very good at labeling things. So the most lucrative application of this is probably labeling. Is someone likely to click on an ad? And for a single company like Google, this can drive more than $100 billion a year in, in, in revenue. Um, but also take an X-ray image labeling with, with a medical diagnosis or something even like um, taking an email and labeling with a spam email a lot. But today there are um, millions of developers building supervised learning applications, labeling things and driving easily many hundreds of billions of dollars of value. Um, <clears throat> The new kitten block is generative AI. Uh, and, and then if those of you that study AI will have heard of other tools like unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. But for today's presentation, I want to focus on supervised learning and generative AI, which I think are probably the two most important tools in the AI developer's toolbox. So this slide shows um, what I think is the value of these different AI technologies today. And if the size of these circles shows value today, then this enlarged circle shows what I think it might grow to in three years, which is an artificially very short time horizon, right? In six years, nine years, I think things will look even uh, very different. But supervised learning with millions of developers building applications today, um, might double in the next three years and go from really massive to even more massive. And generative AI is the new entrance, the new kid on the block, relatively small in terms of commercial value today, but because of the amounts of you know, investment, societal interest, I think it will much more than double um, in the next three years. And maybe in six years, if it continues to compound at this rate, we'll see, it could be even vastly larger. But if you look at this chart, I think the light shaded regions are where there are a lot of opportunities to build exciting AI projects in all sorts of applications. What I hope you take away from this part of the presentation is um, <clears throat> AI as a general purpose technology is useful for many different tasks. And when supervised learning, labeling things, started to work really well maybe about a decade ago, it was a lot of work. You know, it's been like a decade of work so far, we're not yet done, to identify all the places we could apply supervised learning and build those applications. Um, and I think the journey is just starting for generative AI. We're not yet done exploiting supervised learning, but we have this other wonderful new tool in our toolbox um, that certainly is helping with direct-to-consumer applications like ChatGPT and BART, but is also helping companies answer questions about the documents, all sorts of customer service chatbots, building reasoning engines to help companies decide who you send email to, how do you route email, how do you process this versus text document. And I think in the next decade, there'll be a lot of work to be done to figure out and execute a lot of the concrete use cases that are now possible because of generative AI technology. Um, one caveat, there will be fads along the way. How many of you remember the Lenza app? Wow, quite a lot of you. So um, it, this is the app that would let you upload a few pictures of yourself and draw a cool picture of you as a scientist or an astronaut or something. 
And um, its revenues just took off like that. And through last December, a lot of newspaper articles were writing about it, and, and, and it was really hot. And then it did that. And I think Lenza turned out to be maybe one of what will likely turn out to be a series of um, fads that, that there was a good idea. I mean, people liked the product, but it did not create long-term sustaining business value. When I think about Lenza, um, I'm often reminded of uh, an earlier technology revolution when Steve Jobs gave us this. Um, I'm one of the, at that time, uh, someone figured out you know, that you can sell an app for $1.99, which I paid, um, to do this, to turn on the LED flashlight. And it was a good idea. I mean, people liked the product. But this too was also not a long-term sustainable business and soon competitors copied it, underpriced it, got incorporated to iOS. And I think it will be like this too for, um, for the for generative AI infrastructure. Um, just as the iPhone also allowed someone to figure out how to build Uber and Airbnb and Tinder, which became long-term, very valuable businesses that created long-term value, there will be that opportunity as well in generative AI, and that's what I'm excited about working on. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, AI is a general purpose technology means that there are a lot of projects that are yet to be executed on that we have to figure out. Um, there's a second technology trend I want to share with you that relates to why AI isn't more widely adopted yet. Maybe starting with supervised learning, we've been talking about AI you know, for a long time now, but if you go outside consumer software internet, if you go outside tech companies, AI doesn't seem to be that widely applied yet. This illustrates the main re one of the main reasons why, I think which is that if we were to take all current and potential AI projects and sort them in decreasing order of value, then to the left, you get the very high value projects like um, online advertising or web search, where you can build one AI system <clears throat> and apply it to a billion users and derive massive commercial value. And so starting about you know, 10 years ago, um, my friends and I figured out a recipe for how to execute these projects, and it works, and this turns out to be really valuable. Um, but it turns out that once you go outside consumer software internet, hardly anyone you know, has 100 million or, or a billion users that you can build one giant AI system to apply to. And so that recipe of hiring 100 or even more highly paid machine learning engineers to build one giant system, that doesn't work for other industries. Instead, these are some of the projects I'm excited about. Um, we're working with a pizza maker, um, and the, that was taking pictures of the pizza to try to make sure that the cheese is spread evenly. This turns out to be about a $5 million project, uh, but you, know, you can't hire right, 20 or 100 engineers to work on a $5 million project. Um, this is another rare example. We're working with a wheat harvesting company, an agricultural machinery company, and it turns out that after a field of wheat has already grown, if you can use cameras and AI to figure out how tall is the wheat, um, to adjust the harvesting arm to chop off the wheat at the right height, then you get more food for the farmer to sell. Um, it's also better for the environment. But this is another kind of $5 million project. Um, and material grading, a lot of cloth grading, sheet metal grading. What I'm seeing in most industries outside the consumer software internet is that there are tens of thousands of these $5 million projects that are just sitting there because we don't have enough AI talent. You can't hire um, you know, a large AI team to execute on these projects, which are much smaller but very numerous in value. So the second technology trend I'm seeing that, that I find exciting is um, the rise of better tools specifically low-code platforms, sometimes no-code, but I, I'm going to emphasize low-code platforms, that enable the end user to build a custom AI system they need. So for example, the pizza makers' pictures of pizza, they don't exist on the internet. So you know, Google and Bing do not have access to these pictures. But with new tools, um, including tools that let you specify a prompt, or technology that we've been working on called data-centric AI, we're starting to see many tools that lets the IT department of the pizza maker um, use their own data to build a custom AI to realize the value. And I think the total value of all of the, all of the projects in this long tail will be even greater 
than the value that we're seeing in the head of this distribution. And I think I'm excited about this, not just because of the value, but because I think this would be a key part of the recipe for taking AI, which so far works really well in the tech industry and pushing it to all other industries, and which frankly are a much bigger piece of the economy than, than the tech. Sorry to interrupt, we're gonna um, have you stand uh, a little bit forward and I'm gonna hand you this. I wanna make sure our live stream guests can see Andrew. Oh, thank you, all right. Uh, let me just say hello to all of our live stream guests as well. Thank you for dialing in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the puzzle that I want to, there was a puzzle that I was trying to, that I wanted to solve about five years ago, which is five years ago, I felt that with the rise of AI as a general purpose technology, there are a lot of new projects that are now that were possible. And I want to figure out how do we build all of these very different projects you know, in all corners of the economy. And even though I had led AI teams in some big tech companies like Google and Baidu, I could not imagine how to operate a team in a big tech company to go after such a very diverse set of AI opportunities with very different industry segments, very different technologies, very different go to markets. Um, and so I felt back then that starting new companies would be an efficient way to do this, uh, which is why I started AI Fund as a venture studio that partners of entrepreneurs to build companies to go after these very diverse opportunities. Um, and in addition to building startups, which is my focus at AI Fund, uh, I think incumbent companies will also have opportunities to integrate AI into existing businesses. But just to be concrete, you know, where are the opportunities? So this is what I think of as the AI stack. At the lowest level is the hardware uh, layer, which is very valuable. Um, you know, certainly, right, Nvidia's stock price has, has been making the news. Um, uh, but it's very capital intensive and very concentrated with a relatively small number of winners. So I'm not really playing there myself. Um, and then there's also the cloud infrastructure layer, also very capital intensive, very concentrated. Again, I think the clouds, see, you know, they're fantastic businesses, but relatively difficult for new startup entrants. So I'm not playing there myself either, but I think they'll have good opportunities as well. Then there's the developer tooling layer. Um, so OpenAI, for example, uh, the API in Office is a developer tool. I think developer tools now is hyper competitive. Look at all the startups chasing OpenAI, but there will be some mega winners. So from a startup perspective, I tend to play at the developer tooling layer only occasionally and only very carefully when we think we have a team with a material technology advantage, uh, because I think that gives a startup a chance to become yeah, one of those hugely impactful mega winners. Uh, just to distinguish this with the incumbents, many of the large incumbents have a distribution advantage, and so they may not need a technology advantage, but if you're thinking about startups, that technology advantage, I think maybe gives you one of the best shots possible. And what we're seeing with many ways of technology is when it's technology revolution, the media and people in society will focus a lot on you know, the infrastructure and the tooling layer. It's just interesting to read about that in the news. But it turns out that for the infra and tooling layer to be successful, the application layer has to be even more successful because the application layer has to generate enough revenue to pay you know, the infra and tooling layer for that to be successful. And what I'm seeing today is um, there are a lot of opportunities at the application layer where we'll identify projects um, that are huge, huge market opportunities, but frankly, when we enter, looks like it's not that competitive with you know, like maybe two or one company doing something similar. Um, so maybe one, one example, uh, just yesterday I was messaging, uh, was emailing the CEO of Amorai, which is uh, one of AI Fund's portfolio companies, that applies AI to build um, romantic relationship coaching, right? And, you know, I'm an AI guy. I feel like, what do I know about romance? <laughs> and in fact, if you don't believe me that I don't know anything about romance, you can ask my wife, and she will confirm that I know nothing about romance. But when we decided at AI Fund that um, we saw an opportunity to, to apply AI to you know, romantic, to relationship mentoring, um, uh, we wound up partnering with um, the former CEO of Tinder, uh, Renata Nyborg, who because she ran Tinder, 
she knows much more in a systematic way about romantic relationships than I think anyone I know. And with my team's expertise in AI and her very deep expertise in relationships, we're able to build a pretty unique you know, relationship mentor um, that 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 seems to be that that seems to be uh, making a big difference already in the lives of some of his users. Um, and so over the last few years, we've worked on and honed the process of building startups. I'm just going to share with you how we build startups. Um, and maybe this will be useful to some of you as well. But my team's always had access you know, through friends, conversations, to, to a lot of ideas. Um, and I want to walk through this process with one concrete example, which is a startup called Bearing AI, which is uh, uses machine learning to optimize ship routes. Um, so th uh, Google, think of it as Google Maps for ships, where if you're a sea captain, ship captain, steering a large ocean-going vessel, exactly what speed should you steer it at? Go a bit faster, a bit slower. Exactly what route do you take? Um, with machine learning, we can um, help recommend a route to get you there on time and use about 10% less fuel, right? But the genesis of this idea was, again, what do I know about global maritime shipping? Like I've been on a boat, but I'm really not a subject matter expert in maritime shipping. So this idea was shared of us with a large Japanese conglomerate, Mitsui, that operates very large line of, uh, of, of ocean going vessels. And they came to me and said, hey, Andrew, you should build a business to use AI to make ships more fuel efficient. Get them there on time, use less fuel. And in our standard process now, we spent up to a month um, to validate the idea, doing market and technical validation, you know, make sure there's a, there's a large TAM, make sure that uh, their prospective customers favor not unfavorable market dynamics, and make sure the idea is technically feasible. If it passes this gate, <clears throat> we then recruit a CEO, which we call founder in residence, uh, to work with us to shape up the idea. We're fortunate to uh, have found Dylan Kyle, who's a repeat entrepreneur, one successful exit before, to work with us. And in our standard process, we then spent three months uh, building a technical prototype and having deep customer conversations with the CEO. If the company survives this stage, um, we then, which, which uh, two-thirds th two survival rate, um, but if, if, if after that we collectively think it's still a good idea, we then write our pre-seed check-in, and this is gives the company the ability to hire key executives, build an MVP, get some real customers, and that hopefully, often, sets it up to be in a position to raise the next round of funding. Um, and so I've learned, having done this a number of times at, at AI Fund, my swim lane is AI. My job is to make sure we understand the AI tech. But I can't simultaneously be expert in maritime shipping and romantic relationships and, you know, uh, uh, specific healthcare verticals and financial services and on and on and on. And we often work with subject matter experts um, to build these businesses out together. And I found that AI technical expertise is important to perform the accurate technical validation. Uh, in, in areas where technology is evolving rapidly, which it is now, it's still quite tricky to do that. And I think we've always ma managed to ensure that AI tech is built quickly and well and to bring in strong technical teams. Um, and this is really the recipe we followed as well with um, Amor Rai, uh, with, which, which Renata Nyborg um, had, had built into this uh, uh, you know, relationship mentoring company. Um, I want to share with you just one weird thing we do in terms of how we build startups, that, uh, uh, w which actually runs counter to a lot of the standard advice you hear from like, the design studios, which is um, we've learned that we like to engage at the idea stage only when there's a concrete idea. And here's what I mean. Um, these examples of ideas are not concrete. Uh, if you were to tell me, hey, Andrew, you should apply AI to financial services, you know, I don't know what to do with that. I'm not a subject matter expert, and so it's just very inefficient for me to go and learn an industry to figure out where to apply AI. In contrast, not sure you read this, I'll read this out. This is a tongue in cheek, kind of a not a serious idea that one of my partners came up with. It would say, buy G3 eliminates commercials by automatically buying every product and every ad in exchange for not having to see any ads. It's clearly not a serious idea, but it is a concrete. And we've learned that with concrete, concrete ideas can be validated or falsified efficiently gives a clear direction to execute. And it turns out that there are a lot of subject matter experts that deeply understand the industry vertical. They've often thought about a concrete idea you know, for months, sometimes even for one or two years, but have not yet had a build partner. And we've found repeatedly that when we meet up with them and they share the concrete idea with us, we can help validate and then execute um, on the idea very efficiently. Um, and then 
just to share, so I feel like, uh, uh, and, and just to share one, one, one last slide, I'll wrap, I think Jeremy, we're gonna go to fireside chat, which is um, with evolving AI technologies, the set of things we could do with AI seems bigger than ever before. Um, you know, we have so many ideas, we always welcome even more, that we have to use task management tools. We actually use Asana to keep track of all the ideas because it's, it's, it's still, there are actually so many good ideas, including ideas shared with us by you know, Fortune 500 CEOs uh, or by professors that spend their entire career researching a technology. Um, but the number of very exciting opportunities seems very large right now. Um, but with one important caveat, which is we also take responsible AI seriously. So at AI Fund, um, we only work on projects that move humanity forward. And so, for example, we do kill and we have killed projects that we assess to be financially sound, um, but on ethical grounds. And I feel like even as we go on and collectively create you know, massive amounts of value in AI, I think this, is a, this has always been a part of who we are, and I think it's an important part of how we stay as an AI community as well. So that, let me say thank you very much, and looking forward to the, to the chat. Thank you, Andrew. So, got, got a, a lot of food for thought there, um, though I want to start it off with a, a little bit of a warm-up question for you. Um, what is your most fond memory during your time here at Cal? I'll tell you two, one that I'm very fond of and one that I'm really not proud of. Um, so, you know, it's really the friends I made at Cal that, that, that made all the difference to, um, to my experience here. I'll, I'll tell you one memory that still surprises me how much I enjoyed it. Um, I remember the Christmas before I graduated, you know, the Christmas, I was, I was on the job market, slightly stressed about interviewing for jobs. But I remember that Christmas, um, a friend and I were trying to get autonomous helicopters to fly. And so we're working on December 23rd. Both of us were staying here on campus. We're working on December 23rd, work on December 24th. And we said, you know what, let's, let's get together, you know, like, and just work on Christmas. And we just didn't, think any of it. We were like, yeah, I'll see you at 10 a.m. tomorrow, okay? And like, great, see you at 10. And so we actually got together on Christmas Day, um, wrote a lot of codes. Uh, I was in my office in uh, Soda Hall, opposite the road from, from Corey, and we just wrote code. And it was really fun because I was doing it with good friends. Uh, and then that evening, you know, we went out to, to, to do a more normal kind of Christmas celebration. But I found that um, when you have good friends to work with, what more fun is there to do than to hang out with friends and, you know, like, I don't know, write code. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I'll tell you one other thing I'm, I, that, that I still remember quite clearly that I'm probably not very proud of, but uh, when I was a grad student, you know, kind of living on my graduate student stipend, right, which wasn't a lot of money, I figured out what I thought was a brilliant money-saving technique, um, which I then learned was maybe not very clever which is, um, uh, I think the McDonald's on Shattuck Avenue is still around. So it turns out that at that time, I think prices have gone up. Um, you know, if you go to that McDonald's for 20 bucks, you can buy 20 cheeseburgers. And so what I would do is I would go there and buy 20 cheeseburgers and then put them in my freezer at home. So that when I got hungry, I could defrost them in the microwave. I thought it was brilliant because for a $20 bill, you get this huge bag and they'll kind of, wow, here's a lot of food for $20. Um, but I think, I think as I got a little bit older, I realized that maybe it wasn't the smartest health decision, but, but at that time, <laughs> it was being brilliant. Those are awesome stories. Uh, I have many fond memories of late nights in classrooms on campus, uh, just, just building. And uh, I think I see some students here that, that, are, uh, that look pretty tired, that uh, probably uh, uh, pulled some all-nighters and, uh, and have been working hard on their, on their EECS homework. Uh, so you talked about AI um, as the new electricity. It's a, it's a quote that you've become famous for. Um, you know, if, if we think about something like electricity, it's a part of our daily lives. It's not until a power outage that we realize how reliant we are on electricity. You know, how far are we from AI feeling like that where it's ubiquitous and where it feels a part of our day-to-day -day lives and something that we become reliant on? You know, I think all of us use AI, I don't know, many dozens of times a day without knowing it. Um, 
you know, I, I think my life would be much less good without web search. Um, your email would be unusable if not for email spam filters, filtering out spam. Uh, social media, you know, we, I think social media is far from perfect, there's a lot of problems, but teams are filtering out a lot of toxic hate speech using AI today. Um, every time you use a credit card, probably an AI trying to see if your credit card was stolen. Uh, and, and so I think, I, I think that um, we've already reached the point where you know, we all use AI so many times a day. And I think one of the signs of a successful technology is it uh, almost disappears in the background. So when I pick up, when I use my, you know, microwave oven, it's my microwave oven, it's not my electric powered microwave because you just take it for granted. And so I think it's not necessarily a bad thing when you punch in something with your GPS to navigate somewhere, it's just your GPS. It's not your, you don't even bother th to think of it as your AI powered GPS, even though it, it, it really is. So I think there's a sign of success of the technology that we don't actually have to think about it that much anymore. So A is a part of our day-to-day -day lives. I want to talk a little bit about just what is enabled by this new generative AI wave. What is currently not possible today what are you excited about on this new frontier? Boy, you know, so I feel like, um, <clears throat> thanks for the question, Jeremy. I feel like a lot of people see Gen's AI as a consumer too, right? Use ChatGPT, Bard, Bing Ashhead, Anthropic, whatever. And I think it's a very good consumer too. Um, I feel like the power of generative AI, of large language models as a developer too, is still, you know, not fully appreciated. So one example, say I want to build a, let's say I want to build a sentiment classifier. So uh, look at a piece of text, uh, maybe I'm working for a company you want to monitor sentiment on social media, is it trending positive or negative? Um, before large language models, I would have had to have a team maybe work for six months to build and deploy a sentiment classifier, go to collect a data set with thousands of data points, train an AI system, find a cloud service, deploy my model. It was just a lot of work. And I know some of you will think, you know, you can throw together a prototype quickly, but in commercial settings, very good AI teams I've worked with is really like six months to build a robust commercial deployment. Um, but today with large language models, you can write a prompt to say, you know, given this tweet, does this have a positive or negative sentiment? And build what used to take very good AI team six months to build, now many, many people can do in maybe in a day or two. And I think this really opens up the set of things as possible with AI. Um, with generative AI, the two applications I'm seeing built the most by, you know, is uh, some flavor of customer service chatbot. There's uh, many, many companies building that in-house or startups doing that. And then also many, many companies um, in-house or startups doing retrieval augmented generation or basically trying to answer questions using a company's proprietary corpus of documents. Uh, but then beyond this, I feel like um, the set of opportunities feels very large, right? We're seeing AI, uh, various startups applying AI to um, specialized types of documents such as medical documents or legal documents. Um, Amal Rai that I mentioned, we actually uh, was, is, is, was also you know taking advantage of this text revolution. Um, oh, although I will say, I, I think uh, I, 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 I did not realize this myself until a, a few days ago. I found something that I wrote um, that I've forgotten about in September 2020, so more than two years before the release of ChatGPT, where I actually said GPT-3 is a big deal. This will change the way we develop applications. So I, 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 did, I actually did, I kind of knew it was coming, but I didn't realize I actually wrote it down so I can say yes. I'm not just saying I knew it was coming. Actually, it's in the public record. Um, but we started MRI before Chat GPT uh, uh, launched, but then it's, it's been fantastic, clearly, um, with the new ways of technology for us to build on the momentum we're seeing even before Chat GPT, but now to take advantage of new innovations since then. Exciting but I feel times. Like just a lot of things are now possible that weren't before. Exciting times. Raise your hand if you've used AI to help you complete your homework. <laughs> All right, well done. Raise your hand if you've used AI to help you build a product, a hack, a startup. Awesome, awesome, really exciting times. So this is the moment of the talk. It's that moment in the movie when you hear the name of the movie, AI for good. Let's talk about AI for good. What does that mean to you, Andrew? So when you have a general purpose technology, <clears throat> um, there are a lot of things you could do with it. And I feel like, um, 
when I was teaching the deep learning specialization on Coursera, I knew back then a lot of people wanted to make sure we use AI responsibly and ethically. And um, I went and you know purchased and read quite a few books on philosophy, right, and, and ethics. And I was naively thinking, is it possible to come up with a checklist of five things? So if you just do these five things in the checklist, then you'd be ethical. And and in hindsight, I should have known it's just not possible. I just could not come up with five things because humanity has been studying ethics for thousands of years and we still don't really agree what is ethical and what is not ethical. Um, with that caveat that what is good is fuzzy, I think we have a responsibility to do what we can um, to try to build AI use cases that are broadly beneficial for humanity. Um, and in fact, actually, just, just are, you, are you asking this question because you saw me talk about AI for good in the batch today? Yeah, and so deep learning to AI, one of the education agencies we have, we recently announced a specialization called AI for good. Um, which walks through a framework for how to think about building socially impactful projects with multiple stakeholders, including stakeholders that may be vulnerable populations, um, and how to gather feedback and scope and identify projects so that you know, you're not just building something that does well on a test set, but you're doing something that can, that can impact people's lives. So it's one of the specializations that we have on uh, that Deep Learning AI release on Coursera that walks through some examples on applying AI to problems in climate change and disaster recovery and so on that, that I hope will be useful to, to, to you know, people wanting to do this style of work. At the House Fund, we love backing AI startups that are trying to do something good in the world. A great example of that is a company called Echo Health, which actually started by a student on campus in the SCET class. They're building a platform for cardiac care and monitoring, or Shazam for Heartbeats. And one of the things that we saw in terms of their impact um, was during the pandemic, they got rush FDA approval for one of their algorithms uh, for um, early heart failure detection, which was COVID related. Uh, it's just amazing to see how AI can be applied in areas like healthcare to make a big impact. What other segments do you see opportunities for AI? You know, my friends and I, I'm going to answer this question in a roundabout way. My friends and I used to challenge each other, um, name an industry that you don't think AI will revolutionize in the next few years. And I really had a hard time coming up with one. Um, eventually, I thought maybe the hairdressing industry, you know, like, can you really get a robot to cut hair? But I once said that on stage, and then one of my friends who's a robotics professor was, was in the audience, and afterwards she stood up, and I thought somewhat dramatically she pointed at my head, and she said, Andrew, for most people's hairstyles, I couldn't get a robot to cut their hair, but your hairstyle, a robot could totally do that. <laughs> and I think as a general purpose technology, one of the most fun things about work in AI, frankly, is that um, work in AI, you know, at, at, at Berkeley, I was getting to hang out with right, people that fly helicopters uh, and, then, um, uh, and then getting to work with people in healthcare and maritime shipping. And it's just one of the really fun things about working in AI is you, you have an excuse to touch all of these exciting, you know, very diverse industries. Let's keep building on that. The world is full of complex problems, pandemics, natural disasters, global warming, armed conflict, poverty. How can AI be applied to solve some of the world's most pressing problems today? So with the caveat that I'm not a subject matter expert in all of these domains, I just share some things I'm personally excited about. I'm, I'm maybe kind of a, hopefully I won't say things that'll get me into trouble. One of the ideas, so, you know, like probably many of you, very concerned about climate change. Um, one of the things I wish we would allocate more dollars and do more research on is um, climate geoengineering, um, uh, which is a very controversial idea. There are definitely people that hate it. I wrote about climate geoengineering in a weekly newsletter called The Batch, uh, the AI newsletter. Um, uh, and uh, I, you know, frankly, after I did that, I got just a little bit of hate mail saying, how could you even talk about this? But um, uh, I feel like uh, um, I wish I had greater confidence in the ability of governments around the world to reduce carbon emissions. Um, but with the trajectory the world is on, I think that there are technologies we should study quickly for potentially 
um, reflecting more sunlight back out into space so that we can cool down the planet. High altitude aerosol injection, for example. High altitude aerosol sprays, we think, can um, increase the reflectivity of the planet to buy us a little bit more time. Um, but again, the criticisms are, oh, so first, every time I talk about climate change, even to this day, I always get hate mail for um, promulgating the climate change hoax, you, you know, because uh, apparently, uh, you know, uh, but, but despite that, I think people worry, um, how dare we play God to engineer the planet, right? I think we already engineered the planet just somewhat unintentionally and harmed it along the way. And I feel like deep investments in science, including specifically AI-enabled climate modeling, um, I, I'm hoping could be a solution to help us figure out if um, this could be one of the levers to help climate change. So I'm actually occasionally talking to some friends to see if we can get this done. Oh, and by, and by the way, we actually looked at this at AI Fund and concluded, don't know how to build a venture backable startup. I, I don't think this is a for-profit project. At least I don't know how to structure a business model around this and make this a for-profit project. But this is one of those things that I want, one of the solutions that I think um, we could do a lot on. Um, and then one of the, and then the other thing I'm passionate about, I feel like, I still feel today that education is a, is a very strong democratizing force. And so with um, job displacement and inequality, I'm not so naive as to think education is a panacea. There are definitely other forces that contribute to inequality, but all the things being equal, um, more widespread access to education, I think will lead to much more widespread access to opportunities. Um, and, and, and while it definitely won't lead us to perfect you know, fairness, I think it could be a big force to move us in that direction as well. We're, uh, we're happy to be seeing more and more Berkeley entrepreneurs building and applying AI to climate, to education. Mm -hmm. Another great example from our portfolio is a unicorn company called Flexport, a global freight forwarder. And um, you know, we saw them leverage their logistics technology to bring critical supplies to refugees uh, in Ukraine and, um, and applied to uh, a number of really um, disastrous situations um, and um, excited to see more and more Berkeley entrepreneurs building in and around logistics as well. Uh, you know, I have to say, just over the last you know decade, it's been really exciting to see the rise of entrepreneurship um, at Berkeley. Uh, and I think, I think you know, as, as Jeremy saying, health funds been a critical part of that ecosystem, supporting many entrepreneurs, not just investing. But one, one thing, not not to flatter you, one thing I really respect the health fund for was um, health fund started with community and then became a fund. And and what I see is that. Um, that's important because I think you know when your heart's in the right place, when you're there to support the community, um, it, it, it is, is. I find that to be a more effective thing to do, you know, than the venture firms that start up as a venture firm and then try to graft on the community later. So I, I actually really respect, not to flatter, really respect what the house fund has done to build out the community and then also invest and keep on growing it. Thank you, Andrew. You're far too kind. That doesn't mean I'm not going to ask you a few hard questions, though. <laughs> Uh, so we can't talk about uh, AI for good without talking a little bit about the possibilities of evil. Um, whether it's Facebook or ByteDance and TikTok or other big tech companies, it's easy to be skeptical and perhaps fearful about AI. How can we ensure that AI-enabled products that achieve real scale are actually for the betterment of humanity? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I've always been happy to see the set of... Uh, very positive social values that are reflected on the Cal campus. Um, some of you may have seen just a few days ago, um, there was a, I think, I think it was a Harvard undergrad that released a, frankly, I'm gonna say pretty disgusting application that would take pictures of women and invite you to press a button that I don't even wanna say what, what the buttons would let you do, but I thought that was pretty, pretty, you know, not the sort of thing I think any of us should be building, and it, it kind of went viral. Fortunately, I think a lot of the virality was a lot of people saying, this is disgusting, how, how, how are you kind of thinking about using generative AI for these slight, really disturbing purposes? Um, I want to share with you some of the things I've seen with, with the ethics of AI. So candidly, you know, 95% of the time is pretty clear, right? Something is good or something is harmful, but sometimes um, I've struggled as well. Like we, we actually, work on businesses, we look at it and go, boy, should we build this thing or not? And we're actually, we, we really sometimes really don't know what the right call is. And I think in those cases, it's hopeful if um, 
you can collect diverse stakeholder perspectives um, and then have a, a robust you know, discussion and debate. And I think that while that is not guaranteed to lead you to the right decision, I find that on average, this seems to help us reach better decisions. Um, maybe one, one example, um, we're actually working on a startup that um, hopes with that uh, uh, could hope that that we 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 that has a number of civilian applications, but that we found but that we knew could be useful for the military as well for uh, um, surveillance applications, right? Um, to survey and integrate information, um, and so before we did that, we actually did a lot of soul searching. We actually asked ourselves, do we really want to do this? Do we think this will make the world better off? And um, our associate that wrote the investment memo wrote an ethical, responsible AI memo that was three times longer than the investment memo. And we had the whole fund get together, collect diverse perspectives, internal and external, and kind of discuss and debated it. And honestly, it was a little bit controversial. But at the end, after we made a decision, one of our associates said, hey, Andrew, I'm surprised you spent so much time talking over an ethical decision, but, but I'm glad you know, the fund did so. And it came down to, uh, uh, this is not my favorite topic, but I'm just being really candid and sharing with you, right, decisions that we wrestle with. But it comes down to one of those things, you know, um, we all, well, certainly I like living in a democracy. I think democracy is important. And I feel like there's some parts of Silicon Valley that I felt like, um, I feel like democracy has a price. And we live in, we can live in safe California, relatively safe, environments here in California today because there are brave men and women out there that are you know defending this nation and if those of us in AI don't stand up to support them who is going to because there's certainly adversaries of the United States that are using AI um, Russian drones captured in Ukraine have been found to have used semiconductors manufactured in the Western world so if you know people like us don't stand up for democracy who's going to Right. I'm not agree. I'm not expecting everyone to agree with me, and I maybe I'm going to get myself into trouble by talking about one of those somewhat polarizing topics. But uh, when there are these, uh, I would say most of the time it's really clear. Let's do this. Let's not do that. But I think there's just a few cases where it is gray, and I think collecting diverse perspectives and having open discussion and debate, I think on average helps us get to better decisions. And uh, we're, uh, we're in the home of free speech here, too. And I, I appreciate you calling out why uh, this community is unique and different. One of the best things about Berkeley entrepreneurs is we've seen them start with what's the problem that they see in the world that they want to solve. And we believe there's an opportunity to build a huge company that's also hugely impactful and makes the world uh, ultimately a better place. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the people in the room, Andrew, um, you know, saw the Oppenheimer movie. and. What an incredible person and story uh, of a Berkeley innovators breakthrough that changed the world forever. You know, at the same time, people saw that movie and they can't help but wonder, is AI the next A-bomb? Andrew, are there extinction level risks we should be worried about here? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we can all sleep at night. Tell us why. No, but let's say candidly. Honestly, I feel like um, when we deep dive into the uh, so, you know, I think that uh, uh, th there's a nonprofit called SAFE, which I think was actually started by Berkeley grad, uh, Daniel, sorry, I'm embarrassed by his, by his last name, that um, uh, had, uh, you know, well-known AI scientists, including people like Jeff Hinton and Yosha Benjo, um, sign a petition talking about AI extinction risk. But when I look at it, I spoke with Jeff and Yosha and, and many others, candidly, I just don't get it. I don't see a path for AI leading to human extinction. Um, and in fact, uh, if we were to look at the things, the actual human extinction risks, you know, things like climate change leading to a massive depopulation of parts of the planet, um, or much lower probability, maybe an asteroid doing to us what it had done to the dinosaurs, or, or fingers crossed, the next pandemic, I think AI will actually be a key part of the solution. So if you want humanity to survive and thrive for the next thousand years, um, I would much rather make AI go faster rather than slow it down. And um, I feel like the arguments that 
AI could be smarter than people, so it could make us go extinct. I just don't see it. We have entities such as corporations and nation states that are far more powerful than any single person. But you know, we've managed to mostly steer corporations and nation states, not perfectly, but mostly to steer them to the betterment of humankind. And I see no reason why we won't as well for very powerful AI technology. All right, that's good news. To shift gears a little bit, uh, to, to reference a famous uh, Peter Thiel quote, uh, you know, we were promised flying cars, uh, but all we got was 140 characters. You know, this isn't the first AI hype cycle. How do we avoid a similar fate for AI? You know, is, is this for real? Is now the moment? So I think for the last 10 years, maybe 15 years, the f f economic fundamentals of AI have been really positive. So some of the early ways of AI high cycle was when, you know, AI community thought that logical theorem proving would achieve AGI. But back then, frankly, logical theorem proving, it wasn't economically viable. It wasn't actually commercially useful. The idea was maybe we keep investing and it'll be useful someday. But what I've been seeing for many, many years now is the, funda the economic fundamentals of AI are very strong. There are hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe more, being driven of value creation by AI today. And I think this means that there's a very strong economic case for continued reinvestment in AI. Now, there may be some little hype cycles. I think, you know, maybe some technology, some companies will be overhyped and there'll be a valuation correction and maybe some subsets of AI may be overhyped for a short term. So there will be maybe some probably painful corrections along the way if, if some companies end up overvalued or whatever. But I think because AI is creating so much value, I'm actually not worried um, about you know us changing our mind about AI uh, being worthy and important for continued investment for a long time. So AI is for real. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the room or aspiring entrepreneurs. You know, what opportunities are reserved for the incumbents versus opportunities for startups. You alluded to this a little bit uh, in your talk. You know, it's hard, hard not to uh, uh, acknowledge seeing OpenAI and Microsoft, you know, spending billions and billions of dollars to produce their solution. Yeah, you know, I find that um, um, with, major, with many major technological revolutions, uh, there's often room for incumbents and room for um, new entrants. In fact, if you look at the rise of the internet, some incumbents, um, let's see, so Microsoft and Apple were not internet companies, but they did just fine navigating the rise of the internet. And then there are also startups like Google and Amazon, you know, that did really well, right, that they, they were the new entrants. And so I think with the rise of AI, it will be like that too. Um, and I find that when, when we build startups, with a caveat that we're careful to uh, be responsible. I think responsible AI is really important. I find that the speed of decision making in a startup is just breathtaking. And I think that that you know pithy old thing that that the, the main advantage of startups is speed. Um, I think is really true. I mean, I, I, for example, a few weeks ago, I was on a call with uh, Renata Naibo, CEO of Amorai, and we we're talking, and she asked, hey, Andrew, of these two technology architectures, which ones do you think is better? And I said, well, I think architecture one is more future-proof, and I think even easier to build than architecture two. Um, and then she said, okay, great, engineering team, please build architecture one. I said, and I thought, what? Did you just make a major engineering architecture decision, you know, because I said something, you made a decision in like 30 seconds. Um, and, and, and she did. And, and, and I thought about it more after the call, and I realized there was going to be no better way to make the decision. I mean, it's not as if if we sat on it for another week, you know, the quality of the decision would necessarily have gone that much faster. So I find that good CEOs um, are often able to make decisions and execute with a velocity that's just breathtaking and that is extremely difficult for large tech co for, for some of the incumbents to execute on. Um, in one of the large tech companies, I won't name which one, but a lot of friends that complain to me that if you have an idea, step one, um, get marketing review. Step two, get legal review. Step three, get privacy review. And one of my friends recently complained to me that after about a month of going through these reviews, you know, her project got rejected. So. Her, her, the value she created for that company 
after a month of work was exactly zero because it took a month of work by her and a lot of lawyers and a lot of marketers to decide to kill that project. And I and thought, oh, wow, this is just unimaginable for a startup. So having said that, incumbents have huge advantages, especially distribution advantage. Um, and so that makes some of the incumbents really well positioned as well to create and capture value. But I think though, maybe, frankly, there's so much value. I think there's lots of it to go around. Speed. You hear that, startup founders? Speed. So we're coming to the end of our session here. We have a lot of students, engineers, technologists in the room. Andrew, you started deeplearning.ai, which has amazing uh, new courses and resources to learn about AI. I just saw a new one that was launched today. What advice would you give a student or a technologist with an interest in AI systems and entrepreneurship? And what skills and mindsets will be required in this new world on a go-forward basis? So um, I remember uh, uh, kind of, so deep learning started to work really well, maybe around 2010. And I remember around you know, 2013, uh, some people asking me, hey, Andrew, is it, is it too late to jump into deep learning? And I said, no. And in fact, a lot of people that jumped to deep learning around you know, 2010 to 2013, 2014, were in a fantastic position to do a lot of the early work because no one had thought of applying deep learning to that thing before. Um, and frankly, even now, there's so many things we could apply supervised learning to that no one's thought of yet. And then in terms of generative AI, um, actually, I, I, even the last few months, some, I've had some people ask me, hey, Andrew, is it too late to jump to generative AI? I say, no, we're in the such very early beginning innings. And um, we at AI Fund, we repeatedly stumble on what seems like very large opportunities. And when we you know, do our diligence, we find sometimes even zero people working on it. Right? So actually, maybe one example. Spoke with a Fortune 500 CEO a couple of weeks ago. He shared to me a concrete startup idea that I really liked. Um, we did our, we tried to do our diligence. We have online search, local review. We could not find even a single company doing what a Fortune 500 CEO suggested to me as a startup idea. And this guy, you know, he runs a huge company. I think he knows what he's talking about. But it feels like we're stumbling on ideas all the time that um, no one is working on. So I think this is actually a fantastic time to learn about the generative AI technologies, also to learn about AI technologies broadly, and then to figure out where you can apply them. Um, and I think the cost of development of AI systems is lower than ever. So the ability of you know uh, teams at Berkeley, um, uh, new or experienced entrepreneurs, to prototype and get market validation is, is, is lower than ever. So this feels like a good, time with a very rich set of opportunities, a very good time to be jumping into this field. It's not too late, it's just the beginning. Yeah. Andrew, we're gonna end with a fun rapid fire session. I'm gonna ask you a bunch of very quick questions and I'm seeking a quick response. All right, here we go. For food in Berkeley, gourmet ghetto or McDonald's? What? Well, not McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I really like cheese board pizza, though. That's, that's, that's All right, I mean. that'll be gourmet ghetto. On campus, Cory Hall or Soda Hall? Oh, I, Soda, sorry. <laughs> All right, for college, Berkeley or Stanford? <laughs> Both. <laughs> All right, we'll take it, we'll take it. All right, uh, for AI and big tech, Google or Microsoft? Both are great. I really have friends at both. Both are great. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. For classes, MOOCs or in person? I think both. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know. I, I know. I know. We have a binary answer for this one. For AI in general, for good or for evil? What am I supposed to say to that? <laughs> <laughs> for good. For good. All right. For good. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, it's great to have you here, uh, pushing the world forward with AI. Let's give it up for Andrew. Thank you. Hey, and, and just to share one thought for a break, thanks everyone for coming. I find that, you know, I, I live just across the bay. Um, you know, unfortunately, it feels like I haven't spent enough time back on Berkeley campus, and I think with all the excitement on the Cal campus, I, I'd love to find ways to engage more with you know all of you and see if there's anything I could do.
to keep on supporting the Berkeley community because um, yeah, I, 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 I love this community. I still have a lot of friends here, and if there's more we could do together, if there are ways I could do support this community, I would love to find ways to do that. But so thank you all very much for coming today, and Jeremy and Halspun for having thank me. Thank you. Well. Let's give it up one more time. So we got a we got a couple a couple more minutes here um, before we wrap. Um, I want to give some shout outs uh, to the live stream viewers out there. I think you might be here or there. I see you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you know, we, we tried to get a bigger auditorium, and you know how it goes at Cal. It's hard to find space to build and, uh, and uh, you know, let alone study. Uh, so we're working on getting bigger and bigger auditoriums. We're glad we were able to live stream this for you all today. Um, you know, we uh, were overwhelmed by, by the interest in, in signups here and are going to keep doing everything we can to build a community and make it more and more accessible. To all the students here, uh, we, we prioritize students for this event. You are the lifeblood of Berkeley. You are the founders of the next Databricks, of the next OpenAI. We have a lot of student club leaders here and participants. These are the unsung heroes who bleed Cal entrepreneurship. We've got MLab here, AI entrepreneurs at Berkeley, Free Ventures, Build the Future, Cal Hacks. Can't wait for Cal Hacks coming up next month. We've got Kairos, the secret club for top student founders that you'll never hear of until you find your smartest founder friend in there. And the House Fund has supported 14 student-run clubs with funding and resources since inception. Uh, we want to do more. So if you're a student and running an organization that's pushing entrepreneurship and innovation forward at Cal, reach out to us. Thank you to the SCET. This event doesn't happen without you. Students sign up for their classes. Alums give back and mentor their students. Cal Alumni Association, amazing venue. Berkeley Haas and MET, thanks for spreading the word. Uh, Rich Lyons, the Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship pushing the mission forward. Bear, we have folks from Berkeley AI Research here today, making sure Berkeley continues to be the top organization for AI research. My team, the House Fund team, raise your hand if you're part of the House Fund team or the Vesper team that's putting on this event. Uh, let's give it up. <laughs> this, event, this event doesn't happen without you. Thanks to this community. Thank to, thanks to you all for coming. And of course, go Bears. All right. Please exit behind you. Thank you for coming. More events to come.